House will come to order. We are still on messages from the Senate. Message from the Senate. This is the uh, Pulowski motion. Mr. Speaker, I hereby announce the Senate refuses to concur in the House amendments to Senate File 1236, an act relating to higher education. The Senate respectfully requests that a conference committee be appointed thereon, Senate conferees are Bonhoff, uh, Clausen, Miller, Pappas, and Eakin. Signed, Joanne M. Zoff, Secretary of the Senate. Pulowski moves that the House accede to the request of the Senate and that the Speaker appoint a conference committee of five members of the House to meet with the like committee appointed by the Senate on the disagreeing votes of the two Houses. Representative Pulowski. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Senate did not see the wisdom of uh, investing in students, so I would request a conference committee so we can request, so we can correct their error. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion say aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. This is the Hortman motion. Mr. Speaker, I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following House file here was returned as amended by the Senate, in which amendment the concurrence of the House is respectfully requested. House file 19, an act relating to accounts. Hortman moves that the House concur in the Senate amendments to House file 19 and that the bill be repassed as amended by the Senate. Representative Hortman. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. The Senate added to House File 19 the content of Representative Yeruso's bill. Uh, what Representative Yeruso's bill would do would change uh, for tax court purposes that it would treat if you mailed on time as filing on time. So it would apply the mailbox rule that we use in filing our taxes to uh, filing an appeal from tax court. That's the only difference between the House language and the Senate language, and I recommend uh, that we concur. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in, motion, all in favor of the motion to concur say aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 19, as amended by the Senate. Third reading is amended by the Senate. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll. The clerk will close the roll. There being 126 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed as amended, is repassed as amended, and its title agreed to. Simonson moving to a, a Simonson's motion. Mr. Speaker, I hereby announce the passage by the Senate of the following House file herewith returned as amended by the Senate, in which amendment the concurrence of the House is respectfully requested. House file 669, an act relating to public safety. Simonson moves that the House concur in the Senate amendments to House file 669 and that the bill be repassed as amended by the Senate. Representative Simonson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. This, uh, this amendment that was put on by the Senate is very simply a, uh, actually what it is, it's a bill that Representative Rosendahl has carried, um, and it adds a requirement for the statewide radio board to conduct a long-term funding strategy study uh, with respect to funding Armour and 911. So I recommend concurrence. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion to concur, say aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. The uh, clerk will give the bill its third reading as amended by the Senate. Third reading, House File 669 as amended by the Senate. Third reading. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the bill.
clerk will close the roll. There being 107 ayes and 18 nays, the bill is repassed as amended by the Senate and its title agreed to. This is the Mahoney motion. Mr. Speaker, I hereby announce the passage by the Senate. The following House file herewith returned as amended by the Senate. Which amendment to concurrence of the House is respectfully requested? House file 1378, an act relating to workers' compensa workers compensation. Mahoney moves that the House concur in the Senate amendments to House File 1378 and that the bill be repassed as amended by the Senate. Representative Mahoney. Mr. Speaker, that is my motion. Uh, the Senate made a few grammatical changes. Uh, the bill does nothing more than change one set of attorneys over at the Workers' Comp Court of Appeals from unclassified to classified, thus opening it up to uh, more people. Senate bill is, uh, as I said, a little bit more grammatically correct. Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, all in favor of the motion to concur say aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. The, bill, uh, the clerk will give the bill its third reading as amended by the Senate. Third reading, House File 1378 as amended by the Senate. Third reading as amended by the Senate. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. There being 123 ayes and three nays, the bill is passed as amended by the Senate and is title agreed to. Calendar for the day. The first bill on the calendar for the day is House File 458. The clerk will report the bill. House File 458, number two on the calendar for the day, the third engrossment, an act relating to public health. Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, uh, House File 458 uh, is a reasonably simple bill. Uh, what we're trying to do here, or proposing to do, is uh, add some language um, into the current uh, health protection statutes uh, that will uh, ban um, formaldehyde from uh, children's personal care product and uh, you have the the bill in front of you there um, you know we've done a lot of work we've been to the mat several times with folks uh, uh, on this uh, bill we've been to the health human services committee the policy judiciary and commerce committees and worked with uh, anybody that wanted to work uh, to try and make this a better bill, and uh, I think we did that. Uh, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll uh, just point out a few of the things that changed since the original bill uh, was proposed. We, uh, we lowered the, uh, the age uh, for the definition of child from 12 to 8. Uh, we put in some, uh, some exclusions. Uh, into the children's product language there. You can read that, excluding food, beverage, dietary supplement, pharmaceutical product, biologic children's toys that are covered under ASTM international standards, ASTM being American Society for Testing Materials. And uh, down in 1.19, uh, line 1.19, we uh, we put in the word uh, intentionally, and that's uh, really a, a key part of this uh, bill is that 
having that word intentionally in there, and I think that that, uh, that brought, brought some peace for folks. Um, well, I think I'll, I'll leave it there. No, I'm sorry. Uh, Six two point one line two point one to two point five is uh, uh, I'm sorry two point one uh, beginning in August 2015 no retailer may, may sell or offer so so we uh, extended out the time frames there to accommodate people that had uh, uh, businesses that had, so they had time to get stuff off their get the materials off their shelf the the products off their shelf and. Uh, give extra time on that so uh, long story short we accommodated wherever we could and tried to still keep the bill to do what it's intended to do to protect uh, children's health here uh, I can talk a little more about formaldehyde and uh, health hazards that that uh, associated with that chemical but uh, I'll uh, I'll have that discussion as anybody would like more information on that I've got plenty of information to offer uh, but at this uh, at this time, I'll uh, I'll uh, just uh, stand for questions, Mr. Speaker. There's no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 458. Third reading, Representative Abler. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, members, and I'll speak in favor of this bill and the BPA one that's coming. I think these are the reasonable compromises, and uh, you know, and we always say it's for the children. In this case, why do you say that? Because they're so growing and they're so subject to change. And these chemicals can provide a really bad insult to their uh, nervous system and to, um, to their health. And they're, they're much more prone to injury than someone like me or uh, a youngster that reps in a Purcell who's a middle-aged guy. Um, but so uh, this is a good yes vote. I urge people to support it. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the author yield to a question? He will yield. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative uh, Purcell, I'm not all that familiar with formaldehyde. Is formaldehyde always bad? Representative Purcell. Mr. Speaker, Representative Pepin, did, I need that last word. Is formaldehyde what? Harmful, bad. Is it harmful? Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Representative Pepin. Um, yeah, it's uh, it, it it'll kill you in a pretty uh, like a one ounce dose will kill a human being. Representative Pepin. Mr. Speaker, would Representative Purcell continue to yield? He will. Representative Pepin. Representative Purcell, are there any uh, naturally occurring? Is there any is there any formaldehyde in natural occurring foods or products? Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Representative Pepin. Formaldehyde is a naturally occurring substance. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and um, Representative Purcell. So does this uh, bill in any way kind of lay out that not all formaldehyde is necessary, necessarily bad? In other words, I'm worried about unintended consequences of just, you know, talking about children's products and formaldehyde. Is there anything that kind of clarifies that in the bill? Representative Purcell will yield. Representative Purcell. Mr. Speaker, Representative Pepin, I, what, what we're trying to do here is in, in banning formaldehyde is in, in those products that would have intentionally, that, that the manufacturer would intentionally put chemicals into that product, that child's personal care product that could degrade or transform to formaldehyde. And there are several of those. I've got a list of them here. I can provide that to you if you'd like, uh, that are currently used. And there are manufacturers that have committed to not use those particular chemicals that do degrade or transform to formaldehyde. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just have two quick additional questions for you, and then I, I probably am done. Just wondering if, uh, do foods have formaldehyde, and what are they? And then my second question is, and I see what you're getting at here. My second question is, um, 
where are we at at the, it seems like we're going at a state by state approach. Wouldn't it be better to handle this at the federal level so that all states have the same uh, requirements? Representative Purcell will yield. Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Pepin, certainly, uh, I, I, I don't have a list, but there certainly are some foods and decomposition processes that, uh, that have formaldehyde as part of that process. In fact, it's, it's a process that, that's known to many on the planet. And of course, you know, formalin and is a, you know, those things we saw in our science lab, we use that to preserve uh, specimens in science lab, for instance. It's an embalming fluid. So, but what we're trying to do here is to keep it out of children's personal care products. And that it would not be intentionally put in or added to a children's personal care product. So I think that's the line where we believe we have uh, a reasonableness to try and keep it out of those children's personal care products, chemicals that are used that do degrade to, form, to formaldehyde and can be inhaled and, you know, some silly kid would ingest it perhaps, but mostly inhaled in a personal care product, used on skin, those kind of things. Now, your second question about the federal level. Um, yeah, it'd be nice if we could uh, do a lot of things at the federal level, I would argue. Um, but uh, it, it, as often the case, states start these processes, and we look, we have a little bit of an advantage, I would say, a little more of a microcosm, and look at these things, and I would think, offer to you that Minnesota is a little more progressive in looking and protecting children's health. We've done a few things in the last number of years, the last uh, 10, 20 years. And we're going to hear more about this today. We're going to hear another bill here pretty soon about bisphenol A. Uh, and we started that process a couple of years ago here in Minnesota. So, yeah, in the best of all pers possible worlds, we certainly would have a, a federal government that would move on this. They're looking very closely at formaldehyde, and uh, it recently uh, has been affirmed as a carcinogen, um, and we've been arguing about that for 30-some years, uh, kind of like we argued about Agent Orange from Vietnam, eh? We argued whether or not that hurt veterans, uh, and is, yeah, you bet that's a carcinogen, does a lot of other things, so my basic precept here is uh, let's keep this stuff out of children's products and uh, try and keep them more healthy. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate your, uh, what you're trying to do here and your example. I actually have just one, I do have one final question and, I, and if you could just comment on it. I'm a, a Representative uh, Purcell will yield. Representative Pepin. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, my, my one concern with when I asked about the federal level is because I'm not sure what that means for manufacturing at this, if, there, if it's a company that manufactures products all across the country. I'm not sure what that means for what they have to do differently at the state level, and I'm wondering if any groups have come forward with concerns about what, what this uh, state regulation would, would mean for them. Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Pepin. Uh, I've had several groups that, have, that have, we've worked with over the course of this bill. Uh, I, I think the, 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 the easiest way for me to answer your question is that I know of a, a large company, uh, I won't name them, but one of the largest personal care products companies in the United States, probably the world, has committed to not using these formaldehyde related products or chemicals in their products by the end of this calendar year, 2013. Uh, others have expressed that it may be difficult for them, so we put the date out, as I said earlier. Um, it's doable. Uh, it, th these chemicals don't have to be used in, in uh, children's personal care products. Representative Yerusso. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I've worked with Representative Purcell on this bill. Um, I had some of the concerns that Representative Pepin was raising about the occurrence of formaldehyde in some naturally occurring foods and whatnot. It occurs in trace amounts in a number of things because it's a natural degradation product of some things. Um, however, those are very small amounts. 
I have been approached, I think, three times by a national company that produces personal care products. And each time uh, when I've talked to them, I've asked them to work with the parties concerned to define how we could identify a minimal amount that would be acceptable, how that could be tested for and whatnot. Uh, the most recent time was yesterday, uh, excuse me, two days ago. And they have failed to come forward with anything like that. And that's why Representative Purcell and I worked on this and they came up with the um, language that's in the bill to identify formaldehyde that is intentionally added to products. And so we do not need to worry about things that would be naturally occurring. Uh, also, it's uh, not about food, it's about personal care products. Uh, so I'm satisfied with it. Uh, I'm, I'm also impressed with the fact that I have not received the help from the, the companies that came to lobby me about this, that they had the opportunity to do so and they did not come forward with that. And so I, I'm satisfied with what, what Representative Purcell has done on this. Thank you. Representative Quam. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Purcell, I want to thank you for having protection of fetuses in your bill. Seeing no for, oh, Representative Skowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the author yield? He will yield. Representative Skowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Purcell, uh, your discussion with Representative Pepin about um, the occurrence of formaldehyde naturally in foods at certain levels, I heard it characterized by um, Representative Yaruso as trace levels. Um, can you tell us, does it also occur naturally in addition to it occurring naturally in some of our foods, does it also occur naturally in the air and soil? Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Draskowski, yes it does. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the author yield again, please? He will yield. Representative Draskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, Representative Purcell. So formaldehyde in some level naturally occurs in foods, soil, and air. Um, but as I understand your bill, uh, you are going to limit the inputs into production of these particular products to only inputs that contain, as I, it looks like a zero uh, tolerance. It looks like... Uh, it has to be at levels lower than naturally found in the environment. Is that, is that correct? Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Draskowski, what we are doing, when we talk about the environment and what else is out there, I, that, that's not the intent of the bill. The intent of the bill is to keep intentionally added formaldehyde in products that degrade the formaldehyde out of children's personal care products. That's all we're doing. Are there other exposures on the planet to formaldehyde? Yes. Yes, there are. We just want to keep it out of those personal care products that children are exposed to on a fairly regular basis because the toxicity of formaldehyde is significant and it's a carcinogen as well. Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would, would the author yield again, please? He will. Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, Representative Purcell, your bill, does it... I, I heard discussion about the EPA standards, and it sounds like uh, we are, uh, once again, as we do in many environmental areas and uh, many areas in state law in this state, exceeding the limitation or the prohibitions uh, on people and businesses in Minnesota with this bill is what it sounds like to me. Uh, but can you tell me, does your bill provide that they can have zero level, the, the level is zero parts per million of formaldehyde in any product or product that could degrade uh, into formaldehyde as they develop these products? Is that what it is? Is it zero tolerance? Representative Purcell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Representative Draskowski, the tolerance levels that are discussed in the bill is that no chemical 
can be intentionally added to a children's personal care product that's to be sold in Minnesota that contains formaldehyde or a chemical that degrades or decomposes to formaldehyde. So it's, it's, we aren't talking about what's in that children's personal care product in, the, in any kind of a, of, a, of a quantifiable format. We're talking about it, no intentional addition of those chemicals. And uh, I, if I may, Mr. Speaker, and Representative Draskowski, just to reiterate what I, when I responded to Representative Pepin on this, what we, what we do know about this, this is, uh, there, within the industry, there's a transformation that's occurring uh, to remove these chemicals by some in the industry, not by others. So the movement seems to be in the right direction. Uh, the intent here is to err on the side of uh, children's health uh, and to remove or keep out any intentionally added formaldehyde or chemicals that degrade to formaldehyde out of children's personal care products. Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Purcell. Um, members, um, what we see here is a bill that is requiring the state of Minnesota to exceed the EPA mandates around uh, a particular uh, a particular uh, uh, product and the ingredients that go into it. Now, what we have to realize is formaldehyde exists naturally in the air, soil, and food that we already eat. And this is going to put an additional burden upon the manufacturers within Minnesota and the retailers in Minnesota to produce and retail products that require them to distill their ingredients into their products to levels that are lower than are naturally occurring in our environment, that are lower than the EPA requires themselves. Members, this is an additional burden, an additional mandate on the private sector. I'd encourage a no vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. There being 113 ayes and 13 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 459. The clerk will report the bill. House File 459 on the calendar for the day, the second engrossment. An act relating to children's health. Representative Atkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, members. Uh, good morning. This is a similar bill to the formaldehyde bill that uh, Representative Purcell's uh, just presented. I uh, want to start out by thanking the, uh, the folks from the Healthy Legacy Coalition, as well as representatives from industry, for working together to uh, achieve peace on the prairie, or perhaps in this case, peace on the playground. Uh, BPA is something that a number of uh, members on both sides of the aisle voted for, uh, I believe it was three years ago now or four years ago, uh, to take out of uh, certain products, children's products, baby bottles specifically, and sippy cups. Uh, this simply extends that restriction to uh, uh, other products that are infant formula, baby food, and toddler food. Uh, the science supports it. Uh, I'd appreciate your support, and I'd be happy to stand for any questions. There are no further amendments to the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 459. Third reading, Representative Loon. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just wanted to um, make a comment, and I, I wanted to thank uh, Representative Atkins for working with the business community on this. I know there were a number of concerns uh, when the bill was originally introduced, and so I just wanted to uh, acknowledge that. But also just to to make a statement overall, and I am going to support the bill today, but, you know, when when we get into sort of state-by-state state regulation by chemical, it gets very difficult for businesses that, that operate across multiple states in our nation um, to grapple with compliance. And, um, you know, so I think while it would be best if we could address uh, some of these issues at the federal level, so there was some uniformity uh, among that, and I think that would be less confusing and less less problematic. You'd have more compliance. Uh, so I just wanted to, to to put that on the record. I think you've done a, a great job of, of again achieving some peace with businesses and their compliance with it. But um, you know, moving forward, hopefully we can come to some resolution of a better process for for how we deal with these issues. Thank you, Representative Pepin. Mr. Speaker, I'm wondering if Representative Atkins would yield to a question. I'm sure he will. Representative Pepin. Thank you. I'm just wondering, Representative Atkins, is, does this put us in line with the EPA or does it exceed the EPA uh, re regulations on this issue? Representative Atkins. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Pepin. Um, this is more uh, in the ballywick of the FDA, not the EPA. Uh, and the Food and Drug Administration, and I will read off... Uh, uh, and I try not to read, but I don't want to um, quote them without uh, literally quoting them. Uh, they note that infants are sensitive uh, population for BPA because, one, their neurological and endocrine systems are developing, and, two, their hepatic systems for detoxification and elimination of sub su such substances as BPA may be immature. Uh, they also note that they support reasonable steps to reduce exposure of infants to BPA in the food supply. Uh, that's uh, where the FDA is currently, and uh, I would agree also with Representative Lewin. I wish that we could do this federally all at one time. Unfortunately, uh, uh, that's not how it oftentimes works, and in the meantime, I'd at least like to protect Minnesota's uh, infants and children. Representative Pepin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Atkins, you're very good at this, about this kind of not answering a question. I'm just, does this exceed FDA regulations, if that's the appropriate agency? Is that what I gathered from it, this goes further than the FDA? Representative Atkins will yield. Representative thank Atkins. You. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Pepin. I wasn't trying to be evasive, but you asked about the EPA, and I think you meant to reference the FDA. So I quoted the FDA. They have not uh, instituted an outright ban on BPA uh, in the specific products that we're talking about here. There is, however, a ban with respect to sippy cups and, and baby bottles. Minnesota led the nation, adopted that first. I think that was Representative Clark's bill. Um, a number of uh, additional states have since followed. And uh, I literally read off what the FDA's approach is right now, and they support reasonable steps uh, to reduce the exposure of infants to BPA in the food supply. Any further discussion on the bill? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. <laughs> there being 115 ayes and 11 nays, the bill is passed and is title agreed to. The next uh, bill on the calendar for the day is House File 580. The clerk will report the bill. House File 580 on the calendar for today, the first engrossment, an act relating to state government. Representative Simon. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. House File 580 strengthens and modernizes the Safe at Home program. Some of you may have heard of it. It's run by the Secretary of State's office, and it's an address confidentiality program. Minnesota was one of the first states in the country to adopt it under then Secretary of State Kiffmeyer and under Secretary of State Ritchie. It has now grown to include over 1,000 people, well on its way pretty soon to 2,000. Uh, now 30 states in the country have such a program, and a number of you over the last few years, as I've helped uh, with legislation on this program, have approached me and said you had never heard of it, and you're glad you heard of it because you know of people in your districts who could benefit from it. Uh, many people mostly, overwhelmingly so, um, women who were the subject of domestic abuse are enrolled in this program and it's a way that they can keep their addresses confidential. The sort of hook by which the Secretary of State's office is involved, of course, is that these folks have to and want to vote and they want to vote in a way that doesn't give up their uh, address where they're actually residing. So the Secretary of State basically collects their mail make sure uh, that they keep the secret about where they're really residing and that's what the program is and it's been a great success. This bill, House File 580, as I say, strengthens and modernizes it by putting some more guardrails in place. For example, uh, Section 1 uh, basically clarifies eligibility. It says for the first time what we always assumed, which is that you have to be a Minnesota resident in order to be enrolled. It also makes clear, critically, that it doesn't only apply to an affected individual such as a mother, but it also applies to her children or others in the household for whom she has some uh, fears uh, for their safety and with, for their well-being. Um, section 2 has to do the changes with the application process, uh, namely what I just talked about, the residency requirement and so forth. Um, section 3 gives the Secretary of State the power to cancel enrollment if, for example, the person moves out of the state, which makes perfect common sense. And Section 4 is a prohibition on the sharing of addresses. I, I want to say uh, I, I applaud the Secretary of State's office for getting a lot of the stakeholders to the table on this issue. I think we have agreement now on this, and it simply makes it harder uh, for uh, a true address of someone enrolled in the program to be leaked, if you will, uh, so as to preserve and protect the people who are enrolled in the program. That's the bill. There was no audible dissent or disagreement throughout the progress. Uh, or the process, I should say, and I ask for your green vote. Thank you. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Holberg and others moving to amend House File 580, the first engrossment as follows. The amendment is coded A3. Representative Holberg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And this amendment, uh, you'll see both uh, Representative Simon and myself have signed on. What uh, happened this year that I haven't seen happen before is given the number of bills that uh, were introduced that allowed more access to uh, private information on individuals. We found uh, that Beth Frazier from the Secretary of State's office was coming into hearing after hearing asking for special carve-out provisions for the safe at home uh, people that were in the program with these bills. and it became pretty apparent that the standards for the Safe at Home program and its data had not uh, been uh, very well uh, thought through when the program was implemented. And so uh, somewhat late in the session, uh, we worked, in fact, we worked a lot over the Easter break with uh, representatives of ad advocates groups, the Secretary of State's office, and Matt Gehring in House Research to come up with the language that was introduced in House File 1756 that would put the standards of data use for the Safe at Home uh, program uh, participants and provide direction to people or organizations that collect information on them. And so we were able to have a hearing on this bill uh, this morning in the Civil Law Committee and the language in a, the A3 amendment reflects those efforts so that there are standards and procedures for uh, data collected on safe at home participants and uh, I think that uh, we have agreement uh, on all, uh, all sides of this equation on this issue and I would appreciate your support and would be happy to stand for any questions. Representative Simon. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. I strongly support Representative Holberg's amendment. I think it's a great idea, and uh, she's being a bit modest. It was her idea, not the Secretary of State's office, and she spent time over her 
Eastern Passover break, meeting with the stakeholders, as she said, to come up with this. If you favor shrinking the number of words in the state statute books, this is a good idea because it means we don't have to go over and over again to carve out separate exceptions or exemptions for the data practice or for uh, Safe at Home program and the Data Practices Act. Instead, this is a catch all provision that will cover that, and we don't have to add another line or two lines or paragraph to the state statutes every time this happens. So it's a good amendment, and I thank Representative Holberg for it. Seeing no further discussion on the amendment, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. The, uh, there's no other amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 580 as amended. Third reading. Any further discussion on the bill? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. The clerk will close the roll. There being 127 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed as amended and is title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is Senate File 834. The clerk will report the bill. Senate File 834 on the calendar for the day. An act relating to judiciary. To the author of the bill, to the author of the bill, Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, members, this is an agency bill brought to me by the uh, State Guardian Ad Litem Board. It makes some, um, really some clarifications in statute. Um, for example, one of them is technical, and it, it makes it clear that when it refers to guardian fees that are in the bill, it adds the word guardian ad litem, so it's clear that it's about guardian ad litems and not about uh, guardians. Um, but the main change that this bill makes is that it would allow the guardian ad litem board to actually elect their own chair. Um, currently, that is done um, for them, and n that was originally set up because the Guardian Ad Litem Board was new. But now they've been established, and we'd like to make this much more like the Public Defense Board in that they'd be able to elect their own chair. It also removes um, some other language within the bill. Members, it's been non-controversial. The only interest that has really uh, been posed up to this point, um, other than Representative Droskowski's amendment, is to what's not in the bill. This really is not a substantive changing bill, and I would ask for your support. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Dreskowski moving to amend Senate File 834 as follows. The amendment is coded A1. To the author of the amendment, Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, this amendment, uh, we had discussion about this bill in committee. One of the um, issues that the minority and committee brought up was it appeared that and, and certainly did uh, part of the bill does strike the word volunteer from these guardian ad litem statutes and uh, we uh, we expressed our desire to at least keep some reference to volunteer and statutes so that uh, the system was aware that guardian ad litems into the future could still be volunteers and so that's what this amendment do, does i appreciate your support Representative Hillstrom. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would also urge members to support Representative Droskowski's amendment. Is there any further debate on the amendment? Seeing no further debate, all in favor of the Droskowski amendment signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, no. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Seeing no further amendments at the desk, the clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, Senate File 834, as amended. Any further discussion on the bill? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will call the roll on the bill.
clerk will close the roll. There being 77 ayes and 49 nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to. Next bill on the calendar for the day is Senate File 324. Senate File 324 on the calendar for the day, an act relating to the State Auditor. To the author of the bill, Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members. Members, this bill was brought to me by the State Auditor, Rebecca Otto. Uh, members, under current law, the State Auditor is already supposed to be notified when embezzlement or unlawful use of public funds or property has um, occurred. But there are a couple of funds that um, were not a part of that. And so this bill just adds a few more funds to make certain that everyone is reporting to the State Auditor if there's any embezzlement, unlawful use of funds, property, or misuse of public funds by a charter commissioner or any other person authorized to expend the funds um, for these public funds. So, uh, members, I strongly encourage a yes vote. Uh, this passed the Senate uh, 61 to 0. There's an amendment at the desk. Chief Clerk will report the amendment. Run back moving to amend Senate file 324 as follows. The amendment is coded A1. To the author of the amendment, Representative Runbeck. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And members, um, the, the amendment that uh, I'm bringing uh, asks for additional information to be reported to the state auditor. And, and that would be information that is available today, but is just not gathered up into a report that anybody can access. We're talking about the information from local public pension funds uh, and the, uh, the uh, other uh, post-employment benefits, OPEB, other employment benefits, uh, information that should be available to, to the public as to the status of those funds. And it's asking that that information come to the state auditor, be put into a report, and the state auditor would then uh, make that information available to the government finance committees. I urge your support. Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise under a 3.21 and germaneness and would like to offer advice. State your advice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, I rise under 3.21. Motions and propositions must be germane. Uh, Mr. Speaker, this greatly expands the scope of the bill. It also would put into place um, an additional burden on the Secretary of State's office. Um, Mr. Speaker, right now, this bill just talks about government entities reporting to the state auditor. Um, this actually requires the state auditor to prepare a report. Um, it also ends up having the state auditor go out and gather this additional information. So, Mr. Speaker, in addition to it greatly expanding the scope, this actually would put a fiscal note on it. Would also um, be fiscally put the bill fiscally out of balance. And I would ask that you find the bill not germ the amendment not germane. Members' advice, Representative Runbeck, advice. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, well, this, this amendment certainly is the same subject. It does hardly expand the uh, requirements to the state auditor. I mean, uh, all the reports she does provide now or that office provides. This is, this is one uh, for which the information is, is available. Uh, it is becoming something, too, that uh, the bond houses, Moody's, and so on are saying has to be available. They are going to start to look at these multi-employer pension funds and begin to, to require that cities actually know where they stand in terms of the unfundedness with respect to the pension funds and the um, other post-employment benefits. So we're talking about, in both amendments and the bill, the fiduciary responsibility regarding public funds. Uh, this is certainly, certainly uh, germane to the bill. Further advice, Representative Abler. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and members. Um, I hope we do this. Um, actually, I just uh, advice is whether it expands the bill or not, we should do this. I've been keeping a close eye on the budget um, that you guys are proposing to uh, raise. Uh, and there's money on the bottom line. There's $50 million or so left on the bottom line to handle the pensions bill, which is going to come in under budget um, because of some other money you raised from 
the homeowners license, the $5 on homeowners thing. So that saves about $10 million out of the state. So you just take it out of the people. But, um, but there's $10 million left. If this costs a few shekels, we need to know what our pensions are up to. And I, wanted, I promised people at the gas pump I would relate their, their message to you. I was buying gas this morning on the way in. I worked at my clinic and was late getting here. I'm buying gas. And this, this snowbird was there buying some gas. He just got back. He was complaining about the lousy weather. I said, man, this is great weather. And he says, well, you know, in Florida, we don't talk about uh, income taxes. But he said, but those pensions are really a problem. He really said this. He's like, I'm standing there pumping my gas. And he says, what are you going to do with the unfunded pension liability in Minnesota? It's like, uh, I said, you're right. It really is a problem. And then the lady who's next door to me over there says, what are those tax nuts doing down? This is like a grandma. And she says, what are they doing down there uh, with all these things they're raising? And I said, well, I'll bring it forward on the floor of the house. Um, but then also, Mr. Speaker, a trucker stopped in yesterday at my clinic, and I wasn't there. He came back today just to talk to me because he's concerned about the impact on the Senate uh, tax raising bill, um, where they're going to do the subchapter S and 79,000 and all that. And these are just random drive-by things. So. I thought you should know that people are actually paying attention to this, and they're not as innocuous as you might think. Um, but on this sort of a thing, I think we have a duty to put this amendment on. And if it has to go back to ways and means, I'll support getting it back out of there, spending the 100000 or whatever you have to give to um, Miss Otto or whoever the money is. We had better know what our liabilities are, especially when random citizens are catching me at the gas station. So, Mr. Speaker, I urge you either that... If you say it's not germane, we as a body should decide it is germane and take up this important topic. Thank you. Further advice? Further advice, members? Representative Dreskowski, advice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The advice would be, Mr. Speaker, that uh, this report will only cost uh, likely a couple thousand dollars, if anything, uh, beyond what the, the uh, auditor is already uh, allocated, Mr. Speaker, uh, this is very germane to the bill. This is exactly what our state order should be doing. This is helpful to, for us, to, as Representative Abler, I think, articulated very well, to get a handle on Mr. where Speaker? we are in this state. And, and uh, that would Mr. be my advice. Representative Murphy, Thank for you, what Mr. purpose Speaker. do you rise? On, on what order of business are we? We're on the point of order, and this is advice on the point of order. Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I won't say any more, but it does seem like we're straying from advice a bit. Representative Dreskowski, advice. Representative Dean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. To offer advice, I would say that if reporting to the lo on local government debt, pension, and benefit obligations is not relevant to the bill for the auditor, I would wonder what might be relevant to this bill when we look through uh, this report and to think that the report should not somehow be part of the auditor's purview uh, is ridiculous. And to say that if we want to rise under another point of order and saying that it might cost a few thousand dollars, of course the job of the state auditor is to report back and let us know. That is what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, so I think that to find this uh, not germane to the bill uh, should raise serious questions about what the state auditor is doing what uh, ought to be done and to say that they should not be uh, spending any money doing so within the agency's budget should lead us to question that as well. So I ask that the point of order not be well taken. Further advice, members? Mr. Speaker. Representative Mr. Runback. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. One more piece of advice. I think the focus of the bill is uh, local. Uh, officials, local pension funds, and that is the focus of the amendment. Uh, what we're discovering is that when city councils uh, hear their annual report from the, from the auditors and ask about such things as the status of the pension funds, the auditors are saying, well, we rely on PERA. So city officials who want to know the status for their own cities aren't getting information. and. They sit there and, and are making decisions about other debt, uh, 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 you know, to take on for the citizens. So um, clearly it's the very, very same subject. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, further advice? Members, having reviewed the advice of Representatives Hillstrom, Runbeck, Abler, Raskowski, and Dean, I rule that the Hillstrom point of order is well taken. Mr. S Mr. Speaker, I'd like a roll call. 
I'm sorry. I'd like to appeal the decision of the chair. The motion is to appeal the ruling of the chair. And to ask for a roll call. And to ask for a roll call. Seeing the requisite number of hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Runbeck. The question before the body is, shall the decision of the speaker stand as the judgment of the House? A yes or green vote supports the ruling of the speaker. A no or red vote goes against the ruling of the speaker. Representative Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, members, this is at the core of our efforts around fiscal responsibility in this state. If there is, not, if there is any amendment that comes before our body that demonstrates our responsibility as citizens of Minnesota to let them know what the accrued liabilities by our local units of government is, this is the amendment. To vote with the speaker on this is rejecting our uh, responsibility to the people of Minnesota. That's what that vote would do. We have to stand up and, and recognize we are at very difficult times in the state of Minnesota fiscally, and if we don't bring our house in order, Beginning with this amendment, we are failing the people who sent us here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Uh, advice under uh, 3.21. Uh, I have looked at uh, Representative Hillstrom's bill and uh, the amendment, and uh, it is clear, just based on the section of law, that uh, uh, the amendment greatly ex expands the scope of the bill. And I know uh, members are arguing uh, or debating the subject matter, um, and, and I understand that. But I think the standard is about uh, the scope of the bill and whether or not it expands it. And I believe, members, that uh, you should uphold the ruling of the Speaker. Thank you. Further discussion on the motion? Further discussion? Seeing no Mr. further Speaker. discussion. I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, would you Runbeck. just remind us uh, what the red and green vote means, please? Yes, Representative Runberg, uh, Runbeck, a green vote supports the ruling of the Speaker. A red vote is a vote to go against the ruling of the Speaker. Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will call the roll. Clerk will close the roll. There being 71 ayes and 56 nays, the ruling of the speaker is upheld and stands. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, Senate File 324. Third reading. Any further discussion to the bill? Representative Hillstrom. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. Members, let's just make this really clear. What this bill does is it makes a few additional pensions responsible to report any time there's been embezzlement, unlawful use of public funds, and we need to make certain that the auditor has all of this information. So I encourage you to vote green. Seeing no further discussion on the bill, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. There being 127 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next item on the calendar for the day is House File 814. The clerk will report the bill. House File 814, on the calendar for the day, the second engrossment, an act relating to the environment. 
To the author of the bill, Representative Schoen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, uh, you may remember we spent a couple extra minutes on this bill last week, and uh, we sent it back to rules, and I worked with a few folks to make some modifications that I think everybody in this room should be pretty happy with. Uh, what we changed was that uh, the, the person that maybe has to deal with the spill or the release will contact the duty officer. The duty officer can then uh, instruct them to call 911 if the duty officer feels that is necessary. Uh, we also gave some indemnity to the uh, state duty officer. And then uh, from a good friend, Representative Uglum, who uh, wanted a little extra time, we changed the uh, inaction date to January 1st, 2014. Uh, let's uh, vote green and let's go. Any further discussion? Representative Uglum. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Schoen has uh, made all the adjustments that uh, we needed, and this is a very good bill. I would strongly urge everybody to vote green. Thank you. There are no amendments at the desk, so the clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 814. Any further discussion to the bill? Representative Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Would the author stand for one question? The author will yield. Just a, a question, Representative, why you wouldn't have the duty officer call back to 911 if he thought it was necessary. Uh, we talked the other day about if the person who had the spill uh, was in a hurry to get back and clean up the spill and he'd have to wait around to call 911, why not have the duty officer, if he so chooses, call back to 911? Representative Schoen. Mr. Speaker, members, uh, you know, thanks for uh, letting me clarify that. Uh, the importance of that basically is to do with E911 locate. Uh, they may not know if you're out in a, in a field in a township, and the uh, let's say you have an applicator that doesn't know exactly where they are, at, where they are at, and who might be the appropriate uh, uh, responder for that. When they call uh, 911, they'll be able to locate that through our. Uh, great technolo technological advances that we've made in the state for E911 and pinpoint where they are with GPS and get the appropriate responders there in a hurry. Representative Hamilton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to also thank you uh, to you, Representative Schoen, for working with us on our concerns as well. And I ask people to support this. Thank you. Any further discussion to the bill? Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. There being 125 ayes and one nay, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 969. Clerk will report the bill. House File 969, the first engrossment, an act relating to human services. To the author of the bill, Representative Dorholt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And members, this is a DHS uh, department bill uh, addressing chemical and mental health and state operated services. It's their omnibus policy bill, updates some outdated statute and rules applying to children's mental health and state operated services. Um, it adds some additional language for, um, actually repeals language that we've worked really hard over the past decade of removing. Uh, for example, uh, believe it or not, the word retarded was actually in state statute about 17 times. Um, that word is being removed. It's been outdated for 15 years. It's being replaced with developmentally disabled, which is the correct term for that. So a lot of just language cleanup changes, um, pretty mild. Uh, uh, Representative Loeffler's bill, kind of companion to this, passed unanimously the other day, and I'll stand for any questions. There is an amendment at the desk. Chief Clerk will report the amendment. 
Dorholt moving to amend House File 969, the first engrossment, as follows. The amendment is coded A2. To the author of the amendment, Representative Dorholt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. This amendment just made a little technical change on the hospital, uh, which was named in this report. There were some disagreements between DHS and uh, the advocacy group NAMI, um, and they decided to, to work, continue to work on this. So they are in partnership with this bill, um, thanks to that amendment. Further discussion on the amendment? Further discussion? Seeing no further discussion on the amendment, all in favor of the amendment signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 969 as amended. Third reading. Discussion. Any further discussion? Representative Dorholt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have nothing else to say other than thank you. Clerk will take the roll on the bill. The clerk will close the roll. There being 125 ayes and zero nays, the bill is passed and it, as amended and its title agreed to. The next bill on the calendar for the day is House File 975. Clerk will report the bill. House File 975 on the calendar for the day, the third engrossment, an act relating to human services. To the author of the bill, Representative Benson. Uh, Mr. Speaker and members, I'm carrying a bill. It's a uh, House uh, Services Policy Bill. Uh, pretty uh, non-controversial. There are no amendments, but very quickly it has three or four articles. The first one clarifies uh, human services judges, that they have to be licensed Minnesota attorneys, whether they're uh, active, inactive, or retired. It also includes some clarification on uh, time frames for requesting hearings uh, before, this, uh, uh, before the judges, and that was uh, worked out with legal aid and others who were concerned. It has uh, a good uh, new uh, innovation, which I think will uh, make things much more efficient. Um, and that is that hearings will be, uh, can be heard by interactive uh, video, and this will save uh, judges a lot of time uh, and travel time and really speed up the process and help uh, really move um, concerns and requests for hearings that many people have. Article 2 deals with establishing a consul, and I might say uh, this consul is not paid. Um, it is actually uh, made up of representatives of racial, ethnic groups, tribal groups, uh, human services participants, public um, officials, um, faith community legislators, and others. Uh, the objective is to allow uh, folks uh, in uh, racial and ethnic minorities who uh, have concerns that uh, their specific concerns have not been clear, clearly held or heard by the uh, state, and so it simply allows them to meet directly with the cons Commissioner of Human Services. Uh, a companion bill for this language is being carried in House File 310 by Representative Moran, uh, and she could discuss it further if uh, someone were interested in doing that. Article 3 gives the commissioner some authorities to ensure a compliance of all the programs and allows the commissioner to issue administrative subpoenas. This is an effort to assist those who uh, bring um, requests before them. And Article 4 simply eliminates a number of uh, obsolete languages, uh, statutes, and so forth, as has been recommended by uh, the steering uh, committee on performance outcomes uh, that was established by this legislature in 2009. So uh, 
Mr. Speaker and members. That's the essence of the bill. It's a very straightforward one and has seen very little, none really, opposition. So I uh, request a green vote. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are no amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 975. Third reading. Any further discussion to the bill? Any further discussion? Mr. Speaker. Representative Driskowski. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the author yield? He will yield. Representative Driskowski. Thank you. Representative Benson, can you tell me, uh, this is, is this a bill that you wrote or was it one that the agency brought forward and uh, asked you to make changes around? Representative Benson. Mr. Speaker, uh, Representative, yes, this is an agency bill, and I'm carrying it for them. Representative Driskowski. That's all I need to know. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any further discussion to the bill? Any further discussion? Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Close the roll. There being 111 ayes and 14 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next item on the calendar for the day is House File 767. The clerk will report the bill. House File 767, the second engrossment, an act relating to human services. To the author of the bill, Representative Morgan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. This is our third DHS agency bill for the day. House File 767 is a Department of Human Services policy bill containing changes to the continuing care area of the department. Continuing care is a division of the department uh, responsible for the administration of public long-term care programs and services for people with disabilities and older Minnesotans. These include such programs as home and community-based services waiver programs, serving people with disabilities and older Minnesotans, nursing facility rates and policy, deaf and hard of hearing services, and intermediate care facilities for persons with developmental disabilities. House File 767 makes changes that are technical in nature, changes that help conform to federal law, and some policy changes uh, that will improve the efficiency and quality of care for vulnerable adults and people with developmental, de developmental disabilities. I want to thank Representative Abler for a couple of contributions to the bill in the area of uh, personal care assistance and also uh, in case management redesign. Uh, I urge your support for the bill and I'll be happy to answer any questions. There are no amendments at the desk, so the clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House File 767. Third reading. Any discussion of the bill? Any discussion? Seeing no discussion, the clerk will take the roll on the bill. Clerk will close the roll. There being 121 ayes and two nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Motions and resolutions. Copies of the non-controversial uh, motions and resolutions are on the house de at the House desk and online. If there's no objection, we'll take those motions first. Hearing no objection, those motions prevail. 
Announcements by the Speaker. Announcement by the Speaker. The Speaker announces the appointment of the following members of the House to a conference committee on House File 1233. Huntley, Liebling, Loeffler, Moran, and Abler. Announcement by the Speaker. The Speaker announces the appointment of the following members of the House to a conference committee on House File 630. Marquart, Mariani, Reinhardt, Morgan, and Erdahl. Any announcements? Representative Hansen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and uh, members. It's Arbor Day today, and uh, you will be having some trees that are going to start to be distributed. Uh, this is an annual tradition here in the Minnesota House, and uh, Representative Bly provided with me with a book, uh, Elementary Citizenship for Minnesota Schools, 1922. So I want to read just a little bit, bit, little bit from this 1922 book. For many years it has been the custom of the schools to observe Bird and Arbor Day. This day is observed each year on a date fixed by the governor in a general proclamation. Usually the third Friday in April has been fixed. Well, that's now the fourth Friday. Governor Prius, in issuing the proclamation in the spring of 1922, said in part, trees should be planted upon our school grounds, around our homes, along our highways, and amongst our industrial centers. But Arbor Day should be made something more than merely the occasion for planting a few trees. In the schools, there should be a discussion of the relation of trees to our economic and social life. Pupils should be shown that trees are important not merely because they furnish shelter from the sun and wind and lumber to which to build houses, but emphasis should be placed upon their part in providing beautiful surroundings which are so essential to our happiness and environment. Members, those are words from 1922. Now, this tradition of distributing trees for Arbor Day has not been around since 1922, but I know that it has been a tradition of, the, of this house for over 20 years. And with that, uh, this is always a bipartisan process. Representative Loon is going to talk about one of the varieties of trees that we're distributing today. Representative Loon. Thank you, members. Well, one of the trees, we have two varieties. One is the burr oak, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the burr oak. It is a, a native tree, um, native to Minnesota and to the prairies, and what it's often referred to as a majestic tree. This is a tree that uh, can grow, thank you, Mr. Speaker, grow to be uh, very, very large, up to 100 feet high. Uh, can live, uh, typically can live 200 to 300 years, uh, in some cases up to 400 years. So this is a, a very long living but a slow growing tree. So any of you worried about planting it in your yard, and Representative McNamara will give you a little details about planting, um, it, it grows quite slow. So uh, you know, for a, a six-year-old tree, it's probably about um, 20 feet tall, I think. So, um, but. Uh, one of the things that is so marvelous about this tree and why it's been native to the, especially the prairie areas of Minnesota is that it's got a very rough um, gnarled bark that is resistant to prairie fire. So um, they can withstand some many prairie fires. It's drought resistant um, and is just really a spectacular tree, especially when you go through a winter like we have, uh, which seem to be never ending. Um, even without leaves. This is a very beautiful tree, gnarled and, and lovely against the winter landscape. So I hope those of you who have a burr oak enjoy this uh, wherever you choose to plant it. Representative Moline. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. And I have the great honor of presenting to you the red pine, more commonly referred to here in Minnesota as the Norway pine. It was designated as our official state tree by the Minnesota Legislature in 1953. Um, the Norway pine is also called the red pine because of its pale red wood and reddish bark. Uh, they grow up to 80 feet tall. And the tallest uh, Norway pine or red pine in Minnesota is actually in Representative Purcell's district 
in the Lost 40, um, which is part of the Chippewa National Forest. And it's 120 feet tall and 37 inches in diameter. Uh, Itasca State Park currently has about 5,000 acres of red pines. And in Minnesota, the red pine is found from the Twin Cities to the Canadian border. Um, although they are red pines, we often refer to them as Norway pines here in Minnesota because the early explorers thought the tree was a pine that they had seen back home. So members, when the uh, ground thaws in a couple of months here, make sure you get out and plant your trees. And I would yield to Representative McNamara. Representative McNamara. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members, and Representative Moline. I really appreciate that. Again, members, I think we've done this for, uh, I think, 10 years in a row now on the House floor. And it's uh, an honor, again, we're doing the uh, red pine and the bur oak, which are two very important trees in our economy and our culture. As Representative Loon has said, the bur oak being the one that survives a fire in a prairie, and the red pine is our state tree. Members, we've done this for 10 years, but I don't think we've ever done it on Arbor Day when half of our state was still covered in snow. So my job today is to explain to the folks that live, say, in Representative Ann's Elks District, is, which is where these trees came from, by the way. They came from Itasca Greenhouse, a great grower in Cohasset, Minnesota, really on the edge of Grand Rapids, where innovatively they used the steam from the Blandon plant, or am I supposed to say UPM, the Blandon plant, uh, they use the excess steam to heat their greenhouses. If you live in northern Minnesota and, and you're one of those that is going to take a, a pine tree home, I'd recommend you consider putting it in a pot for the next few weeks, maybe let it grow in, inside. If you've got the bur oak, you can easily just put it in your refrigerator and wait until the snow leaves. In Representative Ann's Alps or Representative Fabian's district, it may be in the refrigerator for a month. That will be okay if it's in the refrigerator for a month. If you'd rather watch it grow, feel, feel, feel free to put it in a pot. They are relatively short today, and so you may need to protect them from the deer if you live in an area where deer or rabbits, and so you can wrap a screen around them as they grow bigger. Uh, generally speaking, you would just do that in the winter. Make sure you realize, as Representative Moline said, the Norway pine can grow to 80 feet high, the bur oak can grow to 60 feet high, Give them a place where they have lots of room to grow. And, Mr. Speaker, it's been an honor to do this. Thank you. Other announcements? Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And in the spirit of Arbor Day, I just uh, couldn't resist this opportunity to say to you that oftentimes it's said that the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is today, so be sure and do that. And uh, one thing to say about planting trees, it really is an act of faith in the future. It's really kind of a symbol to say that you believe there will be a tomorrow. And on this Arbor Day, um, little did I know that uh, 30 years ago when uh, Governor Perpich was, was here, I uh, came here with my company in a third grade class of Osseo schools, and we planted Arbor tre uh, trees out on the Capitol Mall right out here. And so here we are 30, 30 years later, and I didn't know I would be here then. But uh, they're quite large, and uh, I'm proud to say that I had something to do with that. Thank you. Representative Carlson. Yeah, uh, Mr. Speaker, members, just a friendly reminder, the Ways and Means Committee will be meeting Monday morning at uh, 9 a.m. in room 200. I thought that would be a popular announcement. <laughs> no, no Saturday session, so that's popular. All right, there. Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just thought that one of us should stand to represent the others in the body who, and to thank those who provided these lovely trees, because this is just a wonderful bipartisan tradition of the House, and I think that we owe a debt of gratitude to our colleagues who have carried on this lovely tradition. Representative Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the majority leader yield for a question? She will yield. Representative Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Murphy, would you tell us, can you give us kind of a roadmap for next week in general? Is it, or conference committees going to be meeting? Is there a schedule for conference committees? Uh, what does kind of the week look like in general for us? Representative Murphy. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Representative Sanders. We'll be back uh, meeting as uh, a body at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon, and I would anticipate we will meet in floor sessions on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, though there's always, you know, that footnote uh, to be uh, determined. You know, we could change things up. But that's my expectation at this point. Uh, we are at the place where conference committees are going to be beginning to meet. I don't anticipate that there will be work done this weekend, uh, but I believe next week they'll begin their work. And uh, we'll be fitting both those things in together because we've got quite a bit of work left to do for Minnesota before the session ends uh, in the middle of May. No, say no. F oh, Representative Holbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the Majority Leader yield? She will. Representative Holbrook. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and uh, Majority Leader Murphy. Will the conference committee meetings be posted on the website of the individual committees that have jurisdiction, or how will the public know when and where the conference committees are meeting? Representative Murphy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and Representative Holberg, and I believe the conference committee uh, meeting times will be posted on uh, the House website. Representative Holberg. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Murphy. Will they be posted under the committee pages of the various committees, or is there a special place where people should look for them? Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Representative Holberg. And I haven't been to the House website, and I know there's been some uh, redesign done. So I would certainly anticipate that they'll be uh, posted uh, in the appropriate place, depending on the conference committee and where those are listed. So it should be easily navigatable for the public and for us. And if there are problems, I wish you'd please come and let me know. Any other announcements? Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members. It's really nice out. And uh, I can tell that we're all anxious to get out of here. And the weather's putting a real pep in our step. There's one other thing that's putting a pep in my step for sure, and I think all of ours, and that's passing uh, the state's budget this week and completing that work. You know, it's balanced honestly for the future and eliminates the deficit. Uh, we we're paying back the school shift, and we're making strategic investments in education and jobs and paying down property taxes for Minnesotans. So that's a good thing. Uh, I think it's really useful work that we have done together for the state of Minnesota, and so I hope you enjoy your weekend's rest. Uh, before we come back next week to do some more work. And with that, Mr. Speaker, I move that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 3 p.m. Monday, April 29, 2013. Representative Murphy moves that when the House adjourns today, it adjourns until 3 p.m. Monday, April 29, 2013. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. The motion prevails. Representative Murphy. I move that the House do now adjourn. Representative Murphy moves that the House do now adjourn. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed, no. Motion prevails. The House is adjourned until Monday, April 29, 2013 at 3 p.m.